um, Dr. Han Si Chong. He is a professor of plant cytogenetics at the Wageningen University and researched since 2010. He had a master's degree and PhD from University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And he is an expert in cytogenetics in relation to plant genetics and breeding. His topic for today is toward the pen genome of banana. Welcome, Professor Handy Jones. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, I will do my best to uh, not to make it too long. We are behind schedule, as I noticed, but that's okay. I uh, I have a well documented PowerPoint, and um, we can, as far as I'm concerned, very well uh, distribute my PowerPoint to the others. Um, and then you can see that I have a lot of information. Okay, so everybody, um, I talk not too much or hardly about chromosomes today, but I am involved in uh, several sequencing projects lately, uh, especially about okra, with my colleagues of East West Seeds and, uh, and Wageningen University. And it is nice to talk about these kinds of things, but then focused on uh, on banana to see actually what happened in the last 20 years, um, which enormous evolution took place, uh, leading to um, the pan genome or a part of the pan genome of banana. So I'm talking first about a couple of properties. You all know the properties, but just to, to, to make clear that these are my starting point for the presentation. Okay, acuminata, musa acuminata, diploid and triploid, and indeed in some cases also tetraploid. We have the hybrids, which have different numbers of A and B genomes. Um, the edible bananas are triploid or the IAB hybrids. And of course, I know Hugo and all the others, it is a bit more complicated, but I keep things uh, simple as possible. The, the diploid subspecies, the cultivars, are often fertile, but may show structural hybridity. And structural hybridity is an old term for heterozygosity for one or few structural rearrangements. What is also possible is that between the A and the B chromosomes, the chromosomes of the A, B genomes in interspecific hybrids, there can be homologous recombination that makes the whole pan genome uh, story even more complicated. And then finally, and I was so grateful to hear from uh, Hugo about what he said about the breeding. Genetics and breeding is indeed very challenging. And it is good that people make a clear awareness of what is possible and even more so what is not possible. And I'm going to give you the highlights of my journey that I did the last few weeks and selected uh, about 23 papers, which I mentioned in the end of the PowerPoint. I'm not going to read them, but again, as I said, we can distribute this PowerPoint and you can take advantage of these papers. So the story starts with um, the genetics, the linkage analysis of diploids, right? We do not talk about those plants that are infertile, we don't talk about the triploids and the, uh, we talk about the diploids and we talk about the complications of rearrangements of structural hybridity. But first we uh, uh, we have to realize that Musa, the diploid uh, bananas, have 22 chromosomes. That means they have 11 bivalents and it means they have also 11 linkage groups. And the crosses between the different subspecies, often they display heterozygosity for structural rearrangements. And then I talk about translocations and to a less extent to inversions. And on the, to the, the, the right top, you see one figure from the beautiful drawings that Shepard published in 1999 in his monograph. Absolute splendid work what he did. And he gave many, many examples that when you cross different diploids, you can see rearrangements. Here you can see a, a, a configuration of three chromosomes plus one, and you can see another, a quadrivalent 
in which four chromosomes are involved. Now, if you see that sort of things, you know, okay, there are translocations. Now, translocations means that linkage analysis is extremely difficult. First of all, you noticed from the genetical point of view in your segregations that several markers, and there can be up to 20% of your markers, they do not obey the Mendelian segregation. So not the three to one in an F2 or the one to one in the back cross. And that means that you have segregation distortion and a lot of problems. But, but let me be very positive. I would say that since the last 10, 12 years, um, statisticians and bioinformaticists develop very beautiful uh, software and here is the first paper in that respect about Musa that I would like to mention from Isabel Hippolyte in 2010. And she showed that um, with a different method, what they call neighbor joining tree, you can show here on this, here your computer will show it. You have a multiple branch and these multiple branch show that on certain point here, you have a break point of a translocation. That means you have an association of markers here that can go either to the direction of this A or it can go to the direction of there. So there are conventional method, mapping methods that fail, but alternatives are uh, neighbor joining trees. And um, Fajr already mentioned to you a nice picture that uh, was made together with the, the statistician um, in the laboratory of plant breeding in Wageningen University, who showed in a different way the linkage groups for um, all the 11 chromosomes. And I show only a very small part because that is essential. Here you see um, chromosome one, linkage group one. And what is here, it means that here you have the, the, the linked groups, the linked markers. And you clearly see that this red signal of linkage group one is connected with a piece that has been entered, uh, uh, mapped on chromosome four. So chromosome four and chromosome one have a breakpoint indicating here is one of the translocations and the chromosome four, here is a piece and there is a piece. You have another piece of a translocation. In other words, this example of a banana has a one four four one translocation. In this case, if you cross these two plants that are homozygous for uh, the translocation, you get translocation heterozygosity. Now, the final remark that I made here in the bottom is important for you to know. If you have heterozygosity for one translocation, you have more or less semi-sterility. So 50% is sterile, 50% is fertile, sorry. But when you have two translocations, then less than 25% of your, of, your, uh, of your gametes will be uh, fertile. That means with two translocations, in this case, you have almost complete sterility. Okay. And now what about the situation if you have hybrids between A and B genomes, so between Acuminata and Baldiciana? Now, first of all, uh, we are able nowadays to discriminate with a technique that is known as a genome painting. And this is a picture from uh, the group Angelique Dont in CIRA 2000, in which the, group, the, the DNA from genome A was labeled with the green color and genome B with the red color and the counter staining, which by the way, is not visible here. But you can see in these chromosome sets that some are green to yellow, which is an overlap is okay. And the others are red. So he, you clearly demonstrate that there is a hybrid, an AB hybrid. Now they also published uh, about 10 years later, uh, meiosis, and that is, I have to say, far more difficult to interpret properly. Beautiful colors, but how we come from this to that, you need a lot of expertise, knowledge, and a bit of fantasy. I could not. Uh, um, reproduce their conclusions, but anyway, they claim that there are recombinations, so chiasma formation, between A and B chromosomes. But anyway, if it is true or not, 
we have also evidence for several other uh, studies that A and B chromosomes, at least partly, they can recombine. Okay, now, that is cytogenetics so far. Uh, uh, gradually, step by step by step, I go with you into more into the genomics. Now, what people did about 12 years ago, very nice study by uh, Regil Bobova from, um, from the group of Jaroslav Dolosov in Olomots. They made an analysis of the repetitive sequences. And for that, they, they fragmented the genomic DNA into small uh, pieces of DNA that they grow in bacteria, the so-called bacteria artificial chromosomes. Probably some of you don't know about it or have forgotten about it, but 10 years ago, the BAC technology, the BAC cloning technology was still very important. But anyway, if you have very small pieces of DNA, you can clearly see where are your repetitive sequences. Now, this is a BAC which is actually gene rich, another BAC here which has a lot of repetitive sequences, and you can see here that uh, with this kind of analysis, you can show you have a lot of T1 copia elements and gypsy elements and lines, and these are the so-called uh, long terminal repeat retrotranspo uh, uh, retrotransposons, which is in general in plant chromosomes, the most common type of repetitive sequences. And also in banana, you have a lot of these retrotransposable elements. I was for myself a little bit surprised that there were many more copias than the gypsies in the examples in which I was involved. Uh, we see that gypsy elements in the region around the centromere, the heterochromat of the centromere, you have a lot more gypsy elements. But anyway, this is an analysis of back clones, and you always can say back clone analysis is not complete. Why that is, I will keep that for another moment. There are not so many DNA transposons, like I mentioned here, and the, the DNA transpo, transposons itself, there are the DNA, DNA-based uh, uh, transposable elements, they are relatively rare. Okay, let's um, look at the back ends. I love really the back end technology as an idea. I know nowadays we can do much faster, also as uh, Hugo mentioned, for $100, you have uh, completely uh, sequenced, but sequencing a genome does not mean that you have assembled the whole genome. And 10 years ago, uh, we used bug and sequencing very effectively, very successfully to, to bring together different scaffolds. Here you have contexts, and the contexts are loose ends, but with paired back end sequences. So here you can see that is this end of the of the back was sequenced, and that uh, matches uh, contact two, and this one contact one. So one and two could be joined in the same way. Two and three can be joined, and so forth. So you can reduce the number of short reads to a number of contacts and bring together finally to scaffolds. So there's a very effective way of using buck and sequencing to. Uh, to make a more successful uh, sequencing assembly effort. Now, the first work that was done by the lab of Arango, it was a nice publication in which they um, studied uh, 23,000 clones with on average an insert of 140 KB, quite big, quite big, I have to say. And they found the same what they mentioned before. You have a lot of uh, ribosomal genes, and here you see also a lot of gypsy elements that are around the centromeres. And not surprisingly, they say, they end up in the paper, you have a microsyntony that shows a high number of collinearity with uh, Oriza sativa and not with Arabidopsis. Now, no one, of course, is surprised about that. Okay, now we talk about 10 years ago, and there was a choice between uh, the, the Illumina sequencing, and on the other side, stream side, the PacBio sequencing. I know, I know there are many more technologies and platforms, but just for the ideas, you can choose between two um, limiting technologies. In the sense, high um, 
Illumina is cheap, but the fragments that you get are small. Let's say two, two times 100 base pairs. But you get a lot of data and the costs are cheap. On the other hand, you can go to PubBio. The fragments that you get are much larger, but the costs are much higher. There's one more uh, element. The error rate in the Illumina is relatively very low. The error rate in the PubBio can be very, very large. But I have to say that the guys in Wageningen who mastered this PubBio, they said, well, if you have the best chemistry and good knowledge, then you can reduce the, uh, the number of errors in your reads of the PAC bio enormously. So anyway, this, this method, these methods are still in development and getting better and better and better. And then with all these efforts and all these new technology, we see that in 2012, uh, in the CIRAT lab um, with, uh, with Angelique Dont, you see that they published in Nature the first complete assembly of uh, banana, of Musa Accominata. Very nice with a lot of uh, duplications that they have been uh, shown, uh, evolutionary duplications. And you also can see in this magnification, sorry, in this magnification, I showed it here. So this is uh, one of the chromosomes I took as an, as an example. Around the centromeres, you see a lot of repeats, that is very difficult to assemble. And here at the end of the chromosomes, you have the, what we call the euchromatic part in which most of the genes are located. And uh, instead, or in contrast to the, I don't know why he, okay, why he chimps itself. And then, so here are the heterochromatic parts with a lot of repeats. On the, on the, on the ends of the chromosomes, you have the euchromatic parts with a lot of genes. So it was a great effort, but everybody knew, and certainly also this group, this is just the beginning. And they claimed the complete assembly, but they knew there were many mistakes. And it is nice to mention that in this uh, Nature paper, almost the whole um, banana community was included because the paper had 64 authors in this Nature paper. Anyway, that is the way how it goes. Okay, so. You want to improve. Also, Angelique Dont and colleagues knew that. You want to improve, you want to correct all those um, mistakes, errors in the assembly and close the gaps. So when are you happy? You are happy when you have an assembly which is perfect from telomere to telomere. So you want to generate a capless assembly which requires the combination of long range technology and a lot of software. I'm not talking in two details, but if you look at papers like this one from Belzer in communications and biology, you can see that they have a lot of different bioinformatical tools in which they can, um, let's say, improve the quality of the uh, assembly. So in the end, they used uh, 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 Oxford Nanopore long read reads you can see with an enormous genome coverage and the high genomic coverage is needed to correct for false positive and false negatives. So to remove all the errors in your data set. And then they said that five of the 11 chromosomes were entirely reconstructed in a single contact from telomere to telomere. Well, that's a great effort, but let's say that it is not the best effort very proudly, I told you I'm involved in Okra, and my colleagues in, um, in Wageningen, recently they published a paper about all the 65 chromosomes of Okra, and by far the majority of all the chromosomes have a complete capless telomere to telomere assembly. And it was really great work. So when you have done the job, you're really happy in terms of what you can do with the sequence information. So with the telomere uh, uh, cap assembly, you know that you get for the first time the content of a complex region like centromeres and clusters of paralogous genes. Now also can see more numerically, I took a part of the table. This is the old uh, 
assembly of the group of Anshali Dom, that was the Nature paper, 29,000 convicts, which were finally reduced uh, to 124. That means there are still some gaps, but there are not that many. You see, the number is, is also of the size in base pair is about, is in Greece with about 25%. And so forth, the number of chromosomes is still the same. Why is that still the same number of chromosomes? Because even if a contact is not uh, closed with the neighbor uh, by cap closure, you still can uh, map a contact using the genetical information, the markers in the genetical map, which is already available. So also here you can see it's a combination of genetical mapping and assembly of all the contexts in the sequence data. Now here you can see what you can do if you finally end up with a beautiful map of, uh, of, no, of all the chromosomes, telomere sequences here, telomere sequences there, and here you have the big mass of the centimeter. Now to give you one idea, in this matrix you can see how many fragments are identical it is very difficult to get this uh, fully and trustfully uh, assembled and uh, to make it a full, complete uh, map of the centromere. Very difficult, but very nice work. Okay, so you may ask, so when you have all the information, what kind of things you can do with it? Now, one of the nice things is that you can use fish, and that is what done in the lab of Jaroslav Dolezel by Simonikova, and colleagues, um, and they collected single copy sequences that they converted into what they call oligoprobes. Very small, 48 base pair single copy sequences, unique sequences. And uh, if you take a very large number, you can cover all the different chromosome arms. And in doing so, with the different chromosome arms, you can compare all these arms with different musa species and banana clones. And that is nice because you can very fast, without any sequencing effort, you can show all the chromosome rearrangements. And, 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 and important is what we, by the way, also showed about 10 years ago, if you have the rearrangements, the translocations and the inversions, the breakpoints, if you know the breakpoints, you can use the breakpoints as a taxonomical mark. So with the information, you can make a tree about how, uh, how these um, cultivars and species were formed. Probably uh, Hugo can later tell me how, according to his re uh, information, these marks are reliable. And then we come uh, to related species, of course, Musa Albaldiziana, it was definitely the number two in the row. And uh, you see, you have a genome which is slightly smaller than Musa Acuminata, still 11 chromosomes. You have a B chromosome that uh, contains about the same number of predicted gene sequences, which is almost identical to those in the A genome. Um, we have shown also cited genetically, but you can, I would very modest and humble say that nowadays by sequencing information, you can even more lovely, nicely demonstrate that there was homeologous recombination between A and the B subgenome chromosomes. And they showed several inversions and uh, translocations. And that you can see in, in two papers, one of Davy uh, in 2030, gave a very, very draft version of the Balbiziana, but the paper of one and colleagues in Nature Plants of two, three years ago, gave you a much better picture of, of the relation between Balbiziana and Acuminata. And you can see here in the colors, red and green, there are inversions, there are translocations, but there are not really not that many. That is not surprising, because as I mentioned in one of my first slides, Balbiciana and Acuminata are able to, uh, to recombine, to show chiasmata. So people continued, not only with the A and the B, but they looked for interspecific 
edible banana genomes and look for recombination sites and structural variation. And they wanted to, to characterize where are the breakpoints of the ABs, the AB hybrids. They could show in general two large structural rearrangement. What I showed also in the previous slide, it was a, res, a, a translocation and an inversion. And not surprisingly, around these breakpoints of translocations and inversions, you have uh, 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 decreased local recombination, you have segregation distortion, and you have aneuploidy in a trip in the triploid progeny. That is why you have so often a lot of problem with fertility. Okay, and one of the methods, if you now have um, a reference genome and the latest um, genome published by the CRAD group gave you a fair, I want to say perfect, but a good reliable uh, map, physical map of, uh, of the A genome. And then you can compare with the, uh, the sequences of Balbiziana and look at the different examples here. I took only one small example of three different AAB. Um, I have to remove a cat. So, so they compared a couple of uh, uh, allotriploid hybrids, and you could see that in general uh, the A and the B DNA was plotted on the on the reference genome. Uh, but some of the parts are open boxes. That means they differ in respect to uh, to the conventional genome classification. So it's very nice, very good uh, information. Now, if you can do this kind of things, we are very close to uh, uh, moving towards uh, the palm genome. Now, the palm genome, just to give you uh, uh, the idea uh, that for the, you look actually on how many genes are in common, which are the core, which you can see in the right top, which are partly overlapping, the dispensable group of genes, and which are very unique of one of the genotypes. And when you are thinking about resistant genes and a few other traits, you are very much interested in which of the genes are very unique. Now, to go to the, finally, to the pen genome of banana, uh, the paper of Wu et al. in scientific reports includes a study of Musa and Ansiti, and that is what you can see here. So, a lot of different uh, Musa, A genome, Cultivars, there's one from Balbiziana. They also include itinerance and the uh, Musa V, the T genome, and several AB hybrids. And in addition to that, they had another species in the Musaceae family is Ancetic. And now you can see what kind of information can be obtained. So you see here Pahang, which is the reference, and several other uh, A genome. Uh, uh, banana, which show very close uh, relation, and you can see that that Ansede here on the left shows a lot of differences in number of genes that they have in common, of which are different. You can reveal a lot more uh, uh, matrices in which you compare the, the shared genes between the different species. Just one example in this nice paper of Reizani. Uh, in plant genome, and uh, taxonomically, you can reveal actually what we already know that Anseta is far away from here, the A group and the B group. So you can very nicely make a, a distinction about the relation of the different species. So that is actually um, the status of the sequencing expert, uh, efforts leading to the Palm genome, we are still far from there. We still have a lot of uh, new information to obtain, but it is nice to see how we have come to that. Now, finally, I have put together the papers that I uh, considered, that I, that I read some of them in detail, others just uh, from a distance. And that is the information I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hans. Um, anybody who have the questions?
Okay. Um, I have one then. Uh, if I want to do the pan genome with other plants, how do I select the species? How diverse of the the variety that I have? How many it's um, how many sample? How many accession do I have to do it? I I think you can use any Musa now you can do because we have you have very strong comparison with the reference genome. You can mm -hmm. do uh, Illumina sequencing. You don't need genes. Because you look at genes and you compare genes. You're not striving for a complete uh, analysis of the assembled genome. You want to see how many genes are in common, how many genes are different. Okay. So you can use any any it's person. Okay. It's not no problem. And it will be done because the papers that I showed you in the end, um, yeah, they claim the plant genome, but they are actually at the very beginning of the plant genome. There's a lot more information to acquire. Right. Anybody else? If you have more questions, you can um, put in the chat box or maybe email to uh, Professor Hans, I likely. And so I think it's um, uh, 